Hi, I want to thank everybody for joining us. And uh, we're here with Jennifer Bing from American Friends Service Committee, who is runs their uh, participation in the No Way to Treat a Child campaign to end Israeli military detention of Palestinian children. It has been uh, just a few days since now 17-year-old Ahed Tamimi was released from uh, Israeli prison. Ahed had been imprisoned uh, for eight months with her mother in prison. And when she got out, she spoke about uh, now she is out of prison, but she left so many people behind in prison, including so many children. So we're going to be talking with Jennifer about the situation of uh, Palestinian child detention by Israel. Thanks so much for joining us, Jennifer. Thanks, Ariel, and welcome, everyone. Can you tell us about how many Palestinian children are arrested each year by Israel? Uh, how old they are, and how many are currently being detained. Right. So um, one thing that's important to talk about when we are learning about Palestinian children in military detention is to know that um, a lot of kids are detained by soldiers, sometimes at checkpoints, sometimes coming out after school, um, maybe at a demonstration, um, any time. And if you're a visitor to the Occupied West Bank, you'll, you'll probably see that. Um, but the age in which legally uh, Israel can detain children starts at age 12. So um, when you say how many people have been detained, pe um, children that go through the military court system starting at the age 12 to the age 18, which is the internationally recognized age as, as a majority, um, that is about 700 children a year um, that actually are prosecuted in the military court system. Um, but as we as you know, you might see in videos, sometimes even children as young as five years old might be held by a soldier at a checkpoint or something like that. So that sometimes uh, is um, confusing to people. But um, so at age 12 is still an incredibly young age for children to be um, taken away from their families and held in a military detention system um, in a and a system that is uh, rife with abuse and um, certainly no respect for international law norms and, and treatment of children. So um, this is uh, a head story has kind of shed a light on a problem um, that has been in existence as long as the occupation. Um, also, if people have ever traveled to the region, they probably have met people who have um, spent some time in prison, 40% um, of the male population, it said, has uh, spent time in prison at, at some point in their lives. So it's a pretty um, common experience, sadly, a common experience um, for um, a lot of uh, uh, children, young people um, and adults. Uh, typically, um, the detention, well, we can talk about like the, the system of law that, that exists is a military legal system so that uh, it, it isn't really a system about justice and finding truth to allegations. It's really a system of control. And that um, uh, I think that it becomes clear when you see the patterns of who gets arrested and, and why and uh, what are the charges and that kind of thing. Um, last month, uh, B'Tselem said there were about 291 children uh, in uh, military detention. Uh, most of them are young boys and they are um, often taken to detention centers that are not in the West Bank. So um, if people remember about the, the kind of intricacies of permits and being able to travel, what that means then is um, 
children are often held in detention centers inside Israel. Uh, and that means it's very difficult for, for family visits and um, for any kind of connection to, to their homes. So um, yeah, so there's about 291. So any, any month it can vary. Um, children, the typical sentence for uh, uh, children for the most common uh, charges for uh, detention happen to be stone throwing. About you know three three quarters of the charges are, are stone throwing, um, and I think it's always shocking to hear about what is the the sentence potential sentence for stone throwing because um, that has a maximum sentence of anywhere from ten to twenty years since it's considered a security offense. Um, so, uh, but a 12 year old is not uh, being uh, typically held for that long. A typical sentence for a child of 12 to 13 years is about three months. Um, and actually there are some limits um, to how long uh, children can be held. Uh, and uh, for 12 to 13 years, a maximum that a child could be held in prison is six months. Uh, 14 to 15 years, they can spend up to 12 months in prison. And once you're 16, you just um, can be held a, like an adult. So the older you are um, can determine the length of your sentence. Um, also, if it, this is your first time uh, being arrested versus multiple times also um, impacts the sentence. Um, but as I said, most of the most of the time, um, children are away uh, for three to four, four, four months. I think another shocking fact about um, this whole system is the conviction rate, uh, that if you are charged with throwing stones and brought into a military court, 99% uh, of the time, you will be found guilty. So uh, that, it basically, you know, if, if you're brought to court and you're charged, you know um, that you're going to be um, found guilty. So what often happens, what lawyers often try to do is, given that scenario, what they're trying to do in the, in the military court is basically get a shorter sentence. So uh, you're, you're negotiating uh, not about guilty or innocent, it's just about how uh, how little time can it possibly be that a child will be detained. And again, it's totally um, pretty arbitrary about um, you know, what the, the military court judge will say and um, yeah, and depending on the child and where they're from and all that. So a lot of us saw the video of Ahed being interrogated shortly after her arrest and saw that uh, threats were made against her family and even sexually inappropriate uh, conduct. Um, the interrogator telling her how attractive her eyes are. Can you tell us a bit about uh, the interrogation process, maybe day versus night, length, mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. story of such. And mm -hmm. I know that it's yeah. dominantly boys. So I mm -hmm. imagine this type of uh, sexual inappropriate conduct is, well, maybe less common. But anyway, yeah, if you could um, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so um, UNICEF and Defense for Children International Palestine, that is the partner in this uh, No Way to Treat a Child campaign, have done a, a bulk of the documentation of what happens to children because Defense for Children International Palestine um, not only uh, uh, does the documentation, but they also represent children in the military courts. So they have a lot of firsthand um, knowledge uh, about what happens. And there is a pattern of um, how children are detained. Often they are uh, arrested, a majority of time they're arrested in the night as Ahed was uh, and taken in the middle of the night. Many times they are blindfolded and hand tied and taken in a military jeep to an interrogation center. And often these interrogation centers are police centers and Israeli settlements nearby um, uh, or 
uh, yeah, other army camps. So it, at that point, the, the kind of process that happens is that, that a child becomes very disoriented. Um, for some children, it's the first time they've left their village. You know, they don't know what's happening to them. Um, their parents aren't able to come with them or intercede or do anything um, to stop the, the soldiers taking them. And then that next 48 hour period is pretty critical because at that point is the interrogation process that you saw the, the video of a head um, interrogation and there have been other videos that um, have come out as well. Interestingly, they're taped by the Israeli military um, that uh, show the process of trying to get information from the children. That, I think that's always a big question for us of like, why are they arresting children? And um, in that interrogation period is where um, they, the interrogator might say, look, you know, just sign this confession that you threw stones and, and we'll let you go home. Or if you just, and they'll take out a photo book of like a funeral procession and say, just give us the names of who all the people are in this funeral procession and who is the one in your village that um, organizes these protests. And, and basically it's an information gathering period that can go from if someone like Ahed says, I'm not gonna answer, I'm, I, I'm gonna stay silent, um, that, that, that kind of escalates the interrogation for the interrogator to be, become more aggressive. I think that has been a pattern. What is important to note that um, over 88% 88 per, 88 of the time, there isn't a lawyer present. There's not an adult present as you saw in Ahed's case. Um, so it's, it, it's incredible psychological pressure. You don't even have to physically abuse a child to usually get them to, to be so scared that they wanna sign a confession. Um, oftentimes they're held in solitary confinement too. Um, that's also been a pattern. So that, that is another way of making a child more and more scared, um, you know, going into, into that uh, situation. I, th I think even us as adults, <laughs> much less a 12 or 13 year old would, um, you know, feel quite anxious and, and eager to go home and eager to get out of, a, of a, the situation. Um, someone like Ahed, who uh, has people in her family and in her community who've experienced the military court and detention system, I'm sure she's, she's heard stories since a child about what happened. So in some ways, she probably was more prepared than others to, to know what her rights are. Uh, and that's also some of the work that um, Defense for Children International Palestine does in the communities is helping to prepare um, children for what they might encounter and to tell them, you know, kind of, there's really nothing you can do in that scenario you saw. Um, it just escalate with Ahed. It didn't get her free. It didn't um, change anything. Um, and oftentimes the confessions that children are asked to sign are written in Hebrew. So it's a language that they don't even read. So they have to kind of trust the interrogator that what they're signing is what they say. Um, we had a, a case that was featured in um, a documentary we made called Detaining Dreams, uh, where um, the young boy who was interrogated, someone came in and said, I'm your lawyer. So just confess to the, to the, to throwing stones and, and the young boy said, no, I'm not gonna confess, I didn't do it. Like I didn't do it. And, and then the, sold, uh, the, the lawyer started to beat him up. And he was like, wait a minute, if you're my lawyer, why are you beating me up? And clearly he wasn't a lawyer, he was a soldier posing as a lawyer. So again, that's another, um, you know, these children are really at the mercy of, of of the interrogators and, and just an incredibly unjust system. Just really shocking that um, Israel is putting 12 and 13 year olds, 14 year olds in solitary confinement. And 
I, I know I hadn't thought about um, the, it being part of a strategy to gain information about who's organizing protests and who attends funerals and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. so and these are the, some of the communities that are targeted in these night rests are the communities that are close to Israeli settlements. So you see, you know, Palestinian villages or communities that are uh, close to settlements that um, have the most army raids or where you see resistance like in Berlin or, or um, you know, where Ahed is from or other communities in the West Bank, that, that is where you see more of the rest and more of the, as the Israel calls it, mapping the villages of getting information about all the people uh, in order to control them um, and in order to control any type of resistance to, uh, to the occupation. And, and that's, that's what it's about. So it's, it's about mapping the village often through the children and through really mm -hmm. tormenting mm -hmm. children. One of mm -hmm. the things that uh, Ahad spoke about after her release that struck me the most and you know, it's heartbreaking to me was that she spoke about Israel trying to prevent her and, and the other child prisoners from studying, um, for her from finishing high school while she was imprisoned. She said that uh, having classes which were run by the prisoners themselves were in themselves an act of resistance. Could you talk about what education is like for Palestinian uh, children who are in Israeli prison mm -hmm. and what if any obligations Israel has, either under their own laws or under international law, to ensure the right to education for child prisoners? Right. Well, um, Defense for Children International wrote a report um, in April of 2016 called No Way to Treat a Child. And in that, they did a comparison uh, between an Israeli uh, detention center, Ofer prison, um, where a lot of um, Palestinian children are held versus OFEC, which is a juvenile detention center for Israeli children. And um, Israeli children don't go through a military court system. They go, they're tried under um, civilian law. And the contrast between what is, was done at OFEC to help children, the, the whole idea is to like help their learning, prepare them to go back into society, be a rehabilitative center um, to help them with the transition of, um, of, of going back into society after being detained and having psychological counselors and staff and the, this really robust um, educational program, which is actually quite commendable. Um, you know, uh, when it comes to juvenile detention, uh, that is totally not what's available to Palestinian children. Um, many of them who have to sit for exams, like the Daujihi exam that um, Ahad took um, and while she was in detention, um, oftentimes the preparation is, is inadequate. Um, they're, for instance, not allowed to um, teach science uh, in, in prison um, because of secure, security concerns. Uh, so they will have Arabic and math classes pretty much and, that, and that's it. Um, the, it. What typically is done is the, the classes are offered um, by older Palestinian prisoners who are also in detention and this is a way of also uh, those prisoners being able to be a support to um, the children who are coming in. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the classes um, are, uh, you know, uh, very minimal 45 minute kind of classes and it's inadequate. I mean, they don't have uh, the, the materials that you would, would have on the, on the outside. Um, Many kids actually want to learn Hebrew when they're in um, detention center, um, which raises a, a whole question about like how, how once children have been in detention, what happens to them afterwards? And it'll be interesting to see um, 
what happens to Ahed. You know, if you listen to her say, I want to be a lawyer now, I, I, uh, that is a common, that is something that other children who've gone through the system have said they come out um, kind of um, more committed to um, justice because they've um, directly experienced injustice uh, and they, or they may come out um, more committed to resist uh, the a- actual opposite of, of what was intended if de- you know, in detaining them in the first place. And, um, and yet other children don't have those support systems. So they come back, um, they uh, retreat from society, they drop out of school, they can't, some, because their schooling has been interrupted, um, many of them can't reintegrate or they've lost a whole year of, of studying so they're not with their friends anymore. And, and uh, it, it, it also, um, one has to recognize that many of them are going back right back into a situation of military occupation. So they might see the soldier who arrested them still in their village. Um, maybe they have to walk past the checkpoint to get to their school, as is the case in, in, in some areas. So again, fearing that they might be grabbed again or the soldiers will come again. And um, it, it just, it has so many repercussions for community and for children. And um, as much as the society tries to um, welcome people back. I mean, Ahed's homecoming was remarkable, <laughs> um, partially because of all the press coverage, um, but for the other 699 children that um, come out of detention, um, there isn't that, that kind of welcome um, home. In some cases, there's certain communities do what they can, but in at least one case that we know, um, that was also in, um, in our documentary, uh, a young uh, boy was told, okay, you're leaving today. And they never told his family. So he was like let out of prison and he's just standing by the side of the road, like, okay, how do I even get home? And, you know, it, it was, so it was not a hero's welcome by any means. Um, and, you know, further traumatizing, further, um, making children, um, you know, question, question authority, question safety. What does safety mean in that scenario? Yeah. You spoke earlier about uh, where, how difficult it is for families to be able to visit their children. And I know Mm -hmm. even in Ahed's case, I think it took a a month or more um, for uh, her father, Basim, to be able to visit her how could you tell us more about this? Yeah, I, well, uh, in part because of, of how the occupation is structured with um, needing to get permits and tra- uh, travel from one place to another is so difficult in any circumstances, really. Uh, but um, also getting uh, into Israel where um, or into the north it, for people that live like in the Hebron area, for instance, for them to to commit to traveling to a detention center to see, potentially see their child, which actually usually the only time parents can see their children is for a court hearing. So when the children are bought, brought into the military court is often the first time and maybe the only time that they will see their child. Um, and I was in one of those um, court sessions once as an observer and you know you're not allowed to talk to your child you can there's no touch um people like whisper it's really heartbreaking i sat by a mother who just silently sobbed in the corner as she looked at her son who was like saying mama mama it's okay i'm i'm strong i'll be okay you know he's calming her down and and it was it's just heartbreaking um there's no phone calls in prison. Um, there, you know, there's no, you, you don't get letters. Uh, so there really is uh, total isolation from your family and, and peers. And um, yeah, it's it, it, just describing the process and what happens um, really uh, has led uh, people to 
question <laughs> the occupation, question things in a way that, um, you know, we always say this has to end. There needs, people need to live with a life of dignity and freedom. And, but um, I think unless you've been there, you don't necessarily know um, all these kind of intricate details. Um, and that's why we started the No Way to Treat a Child campaign, because we wanted to talk about the treatment of children, that um, this kind of treatment is uh, inexcusable. It's uh, it, against international law. Any person with a heart um, can see that um, this, it, it, there's no justification for what for what's happening even if you're um you try to make an argument that this is to protect security how can how can that be it's just it's just not and i think most people see that and um i'm excited that there are now members of congress that actually have uh taken up this issue have spoken about the issue um three years ago when we were knocking on doors in the halls of Congress, uh, we weren't sure if people would respond, you know, uh, because we've become so jaded in this work to think that, um, you know, uh, people don't, aren't, aren't going to care about children. But uh, just like we've seen at our own U.S. borders, that the minute that you start talking about children being taken away from their families and held in cages and detention centers um, with no rights, that's, that kind of crosses boundaries, um, whatever your political leanings are that, that can speak to you. And um, so we were pleased to find a champion in Betty McCollum, uh, a representative from uh, Minnesota who watched a couple of videos of children being detained, read the UNICEF report, looked at other human rights uh, reports and including the own, the, our US State Department report that has talked about this issue over the last decade and just said, yep, yeah, no, <laughs> uh, this isn't right. Like Israeli and Palestinian children should be treated equally and uh, we shouldn't be um, financing this with our tax dollars. So that, that kind of started a, a, a wonderful uh, couple of years of talking about this issue on Capitol Hill and finding allies and um, people to uh, do more than just say, I'm sorry, but actually in private, but actually put their name onto public letters and now to sponsor legislation. So could you tell us about uh, this legislation, where it's at, and what people can do to get their members involved? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, um, well, first of all, it's, it's got a long name, but you can remember the, the numbers, 4391 uh, is, uh, is maybe easier than saying the promoting human rights by ending Israeli military detention of Palestinian children act. It's like, okay, <laughs> it's typical uh, <laughs> bill language, right? Um, but HR 4391 was introduced last November. Uh, it started with 12 co-sponsors with um, Betty McCullum. Uh, and uh, by the end of the year, um, well, to, by, uh, up at this point, we have now 30 members of Congress who've um, signed on to the, to the bill, uh, which is exciting. Um, they, many of them are members of the Progressive Caucus. Um, but not all of them. Uh, some of them have spoken out on other human rights issues in Israel and Palestine. Some are new to the issue. Um, some are approach it as a human rights issue. Others approach it for uh, from a perspective of what will bring lasting peace to the region. There's all kinds of, of motivations. Um, I think it's exciting for us as organizers and activists around the country to actually have something that we can go and say to our member of Congress, do you support this or do you not? Because if you don't support the bill, then it does mean that you want your tax money to be spent on detain, um, detaining Palestinian children. So that 
you know, um, so I, I have a friend in Indiana who says, oh, I can't go and talk to my member of Congress because they're a supporter of the Tea Party. And I say, well, put them on the record, like have them make a statement. I support sending U.S. military aid to Israel to detain Palestinian children as young as 12 years old for throwing stones. Put that in writing, like, and uh, so that I think it's a, it's a great way to um, hold people accountable. That's what we haven't done for so many years, um, and I, I think as we are seeing in our movement in general, whether we're talking about house demolitions or ending the blockade of Gaza or restoring funding to UNRWA or um, you know, all these issues that, that we are advocating for, we, we're, we're gaining ground and we're having discussions that um, we haven't had in the many decades that I've been working on this issue. So I'm quite excited about it. Well, I want to thank you for being on with us. We are just about out of time and uh, we will put uh, in the caption for this video a uh, link so that you can message your Great. member of Congress and tell them to sign on to HR 3941? 4391, yeah. And actually there's a there's a uh, citizen sign on co um, petition too. So um, that, you know, we, we uh, are copying now Senator Sanders and his citizen co-signing um, petition. So also on the no way to treat a child.org site and we can put a link to that um, maybe in your comments. Um, people can sign as an individual. So if you can't get your member of Congress, we hope to have at least 10,000 signatures by the end of the year supporting this um, bill. You add your name and that's no yes. way to be child.org. Right. So thank you so much, Jennifer, for being with us. And let's hope we soon get the rest of the children out of Israeli prison. Thank you for your activism. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.